Good evening, everybody. Hi, it's Michaela, president of the Sisterhood. And tonight is our final Sisterhood event for the year. It's been a very unusual year, but we've had some wonderful programming, which I really hope you've all enjoyed. And I want to say a big thanks to Robin and Susan for all their help that they gave me. And hopefully next year we can all meet in person. But for tonight, our closing speaker is Paula Samuel. And Paula is a mom of two boys, Joshua and Dan, uh, sorry, Joshua and Julian, I should know this. And um, she is a broadcast journalist, an entrepreneur. She is a ball of energy. You're going to really love listening to Paula tell her stories. She's worked with CBC National and CBC News. She was also um, at Global news as a reporter and anchor so you might remember her from there and she is going to talk to us tonight about the life lessons she's learned through people's stories so if you have any questions please pop them in the chat and we'll get to them after and i'm going to pass it over to you paula thank you michaela and thank you for remembering my son's name <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. My name is Paula Samuel, as Michaela said. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the prob, proud mom of two boys, or actually teenagers, man boys um, now, but I'm a journalist. I am an entrepreneur. I'm a philanthropist and a budding author about to finish and publish my first book. And I love to always say I'm an optimist, always have been, even before it was trendy to be positive. So tonight, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about my career and the incredible lessons I've learned along the way. But I'm going to tell you first how it all started. Since I was a little girl, I always had a penchant for adventure. I was enamored with Indiana Jones movies, and I was convinced that I would be a spy. In fact, I was always convinced, also convinced that I'd been a spy in La Résistance during World War II. But my dad convinced me that I was way too noticeable to be a spy. Big hair, loud laugh, not a good combination to be unnoticed in the world of espionage. So I decided that journalism was the answer. After graduating with a BA in English Lit at McGill, I followed my then boyfriend to California. He had a contract. He worked for CAE Electronics here in Montreal, and they had a contract with NASA Ames in California. But I was a girlfriend. I had no visa. I had no ability to work in the States legally. My parents and Everyone else around me warned me that no one would ever hire me without a working visa, but I kind of knew I'd figure it out. So I packed my bags, moved to California with no contacts in journalism whatsoever, just a determined heart and a no fail attitude. My first day there, I tore out a page from the yellow pages and literally went knocking on every TV station door. I literally took it, had it folded up, went to San Francisco. I'd never even been to San Francisco and went knocking. I just found the addresses and went knocking on the door. I charmed my way um, through security guard after security guard and I got in just to talk to people, just to get in front of people. My first massive surprise was that most of the people in charge, the producers of the shows were women. In fact, unlike the corporate world in the 90s, newsrooms were packed with women in places of power. Newsrooms have a really interesting and unique dynamic. Production assistants who barely earn a living and anchors who earn millions of dollars and everyone in between all work in the same big room, the newsroom, all working towards the same big goal to get the news on the air by the six o'clock deadline or the 11 o'clock deadline, whatever newscast you're working for at the time. I was immediately hooked with the energy, the buzz, the excitement of breaking news. Now this was 1990, CNN was in its infancy. So I decided to find the San Francisco CNN Bureau and knock on their door. When I got there, there was this little bureau. Um, the, I, I saw this guy, like I was, you know, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna go and see if I can get an internship with CNN. And there was this guy, I still remember it, he had this big microphone like this and he was like leaning back on his chair and he was telling everyone where to go and which camera to go. And I thought, ah, this is news, this is news. And I, I knocked on the door and I said, hi, um, my name is Paula. And I'm like, I'd love to work for CNN. And he looked up at me and he said, where are you from? And I said, Montreal. And he said, well, where'd you go to school? And I said, McGill. And he's like, McGill? That's like the Harvard of Canada, come on in. So I went in, spoke to him and within an hour, I had secured my first internship with CNN. Now remember there were no 24 hour news stations at the time. CNN was the only one and everyone was flying by the seat of their pants, figuring out as they went along. And because CNN was so new, they needed bodies. 
So I got sent out to do interviews I really had no business doing. I interviewed California senators, politicians, well-known stars. I was literally ignorance on fire. I had, I would just like charm, you know, I would just ask questions and mumble my way through, but it was an amazing experience. From there, I was able to get another internship at CBS in San Francisco. This one, um, they actually helped me to eventually sponsor me and hire me under the pretenses of meeting someone who spoke French. I was a production assistant, which to me, was, I mean, it's the lowest of the low of the, of, the, of the levels in a newsroom, but I didn't care. I was just around reporters and anchors and I was learning as much as I can, I could. And I tagged along with reporters whenever I could to go and watch them covering some of the most awe-inspiring stories, including the devastating Oakland fires of 1991. Now, if you're not familiar where Oakland is, it's where Berkeley University is and it's part of the greater San Francisco area. It took three days to put out that fire. It was all in residential areas and I was there every single day with reporters and cameramen. We watched as the fire destroyed homes, memories, lives. It ultimately killed 25 people. It injured 150 people, destroyed 1500 acres and almost 3000 homes. It's, it wasn't like a lot of the fires that we see now, the bush fires and that we see in California. This was homes that were catching on fire. The economic loss of that fire was close to $1.5 billion. It was a massive lesson for the young cub reporter version of me. I watched reporters and cameramen figure out the delicate dance between reporting and empathy. It taught me an amazing lesson of the strength and resilience of the human spirit. And it was my first real lesson on how powerful human stories really are. I stayed at that job for a few years and I finally got my big break working my first real job as a reporter in Monterey, California, which also meant I got to cover Carmel where Clint Eastwood had just finished his term as mayor. Now Monterey and Carmel at the time and still is was packed with old Hollywood stars. It was on the leading edge of environmentalism and it was, which was way before it was even something people were talking about here. And yes, I did meet and interview Clint Eastwood, gorgeous and charming as you would expect. So that was my California experience. Now, after four years of all these amazing things that I did in California, my boyfriend and I um, decided that it was time to come home to Montreal. We wanted to get married and start a family. And we never really envisioned ourselves living in California. We were always true Montrealers at heart and we wanted to come back. And so I landed in Montreal um, and I started it with zero contacts again. I had to start all over again, knocking on doors and getting people to give me a chance. I had more experience under my belt, but I still didn't know anybody. This was way before social media. Um, so there's not, not like you could connect people with, you know, it was harder to get connect the dots. I actually came full circle and landed at CBC News World, which at the time was Canada's first all news channel. I worked as a national producer for News World and the National with Peter Mansbridge. It was an incredible time, incredible time to be working in news for a national network coming out of Quebec. Absolutely every single massive story in Canada was coming out of this province. And I was privileged to be on the front line of every single one, including the PQ's rise to power in 1994, the 1995 refer referendum, which I covered by the way, in the middle of the media pit at the night of the referendum, I was in the Palais des Congrès, which was the We Side headquarters. And I, um, it, it was one of the only times that French media and English media were, there was so much tension because we usually always work really well together, but that night was filled with animosity and tension. And I was with dozens of other journalists who was the old Palais de Congrès, you were sitting in the main room and you could look up and there were kind of windows where the offices were and that's where Jacques Parizeau was. And we watched him go from one end of the room through the windows to the other with a full drink. Then he'd get to the other side, he'd have an empty drink, he'd come back with a full drink. And we watched him drinking more and more before he uttered his now infamous money and the ethnic vote comment. Um, it was, I know a lot of you remember that line, being there was unbelievable. And literally we we're all looking around going, did he actually just say that? Like it was just, it was something to witness history in the making right before our eyes. I was also on the front line of watching the rise of Lucien Bouchard. And 
you know, other than the referendum, I got to cover the Saguenay floods of the summer of 1996. And if you don't remember it in two days, what, it, what happened with Saguenay floods, in two days in the summer of 1996, rainfall accumulated that was equivalent to the volume of the water that tumbles over Niagara Falls in four weeks. Two days of rain equal to Niagara Falls water in four weeks. It was the biggest ever overland flood in the 20th century Canadian history. The only way we could ever go see the damage was getting on Canadian Army helicopters. And again, covering those kinds of stories, you see the unbelievable spirit of people. And it's humbling to sort of cover those stories, but really watch how people are losing, you know, everything that they have and still trying to help other people. It was really... It's an incredible thing to watch. And then of course there was the ice storm of 1998 and I'm sure everyone remembers that one. Now, we had, when the ice storm hit, when it started to rain, we had no idea that the ice storm was going to turn into what it did. We knew it was something big, um, but we didn't realize it was this big. We basically ran at the CBC on adrenaline for more than three weeks. CBC didn't have any power. Um, it was running on generators. Most journalists who were working had no power either. Many were sleeping and showering at the CBC, many with their families because nobody had anywhere to go. And as a journalist, you don't have the option of not working when all hell is breaking loose all over the world because that's exactly when you need to step up and work your hardest. At the time I was newly married and living, um, I don't know if anybody you guys know the old church that was turned into condos in the McGill ghetto on the corner of Jeanne Moss and Prince Arthur, uh, sorry, Prince Albert in the ghetto. That was our first real home and that's where we lived. And it was one of the only places in the greater Montreal area that never lost power during the entire ice storm. So I would come home after working 18 hour days, almost every night I would inevitably open my door and walk into another family camping out in our living room because People would keep losing power and keep calling everyone saying, do you have power, do you have power? And we always had power. So people just kept piling in and I would climb over people, crash in bed, get a call from my producer five hours later and go back to work. It was exciting. It was exhilarating. It was exhausting. Um, and the other thing is, is because during the ice storm, one of the things that you get to do as a journalist is you get to take a peek at things that you don't normally see when you're living life day to day. And so the beauty of the ice storm, the crystal wonderland that you could see at five in the morning when I would you know, crunch through to go to work, crunch through the ice to go to the work was magical. And those are some of the things that you get to witness when you're a journalist. Now news, especially these days gets a really bad rap, but it's times like the ice storm or the past year during the pandemic, that news, local news is so essential. There's a phrase that we often use in newsrooms that all news is local which basically means the news that impacts people the most is what's happening in our own backyard. So for example, when Israel is at war with Hamas, what's impacting us here at home are the Palestinian rallies that are where they're shouting anti-Semitic slurs and tropes. That's the local part of news. Okay, so on to my career. So by 1999, after five years of nonstop news coverage and working regular 15 to 18 hour days, I was completely burnt out and I was pregnant. So I saw it as an opportunity to take a much needed break. I took four years off to have my kids. Now I have two very strong sides. One side is my journalistic side and my other side is my entrepreneurial side. So during my extended mat leave, my entrepreneurial side kicked in and I decided to open a store inspired by the stores that I loved while I was living in California. I partnered with a few people, opened up one in Westmount and we sold one-of-a-kind gifts and hand-painted furniture. And eventually I opened another one in Trombla. I'm not gonna lie, retail was hard, really hard. By the end of that four-year run, I was ready to go back to a newsroom <laughs> because it was easier than running a retail store. This time though, I wanted to get out of producing and back on the air. So within months, I started working at Global TV as a reporter, then anchor and morning show host. By now I was the mother of two little boys and that brought me a completely different perspective to my stories and the way I interviewed people and the way I listened to people. I had a new level of compassion that I didn't have before having kids. My career at Global lasted 14 years. I interviewed politicians, musicians, actors, everyday heroes. I had doors slammed in my face more times than I can remember. I chased countless people down the streets 
to get even a little small sound bite out of them. Um, but it was always worth the, the, you know, we called it the slog and being out in the field. It was, it was always worth it when you could come back, tell stories, especially stories of everyday people who, the stories that inspired me most were the stories of people who didn't think they could make it and found a way. And there were so many of those stories. But as much as I adored my career, I always felt like something was missing. I was always wanting something more. I just didn't know what it was. About 10 years ago, I started, while I was full-time at Global TV, I started a business in health and wellness. And through that business, I started working on my own personal development. I started to tap into an inner knowing that I'd always called my gut. In fact, since I was a kid, I always used to tell people, follow your gut and you'll know just what to do. My gut kept telling me that there was something more that I should be doing. But I kept working, reporting, because like I said, I love telling people stories. But then about four years ago, it was actually in the days when we could travel, my family and I went to Israel for my nephew's bar mitzvah. Now, I know Israel really well. I've lived on the kibbutz. Um, you know, I did an ulpan. I've been there many times. I know Israel. So I didn't expect that trip to be a massive aha moment. I realized, so I have an antenna for stories. Wherever I go, I see people just talk to people. I see stories, right? Everywhere I went in Israel four years ago, I saw incredible stories that no one ever talks about outside of Israel. Like two lifeguards that I met on the beach. Um, one named Avi, one named Osama. Avi, the Israeli Jew, Osama, the Arab Israeli, they were best friends. Osama was actually the head lifeguard of this entire strip of Israeli beach. And they were both saving lives together. It was incredibly inspirational. Or uh, uh, another man that I met in Ilat who owned an Airbnb that we stayed at, but also happened to have developed the only snorkeling therapy in the world for troubled kids. Another incredibly inspirational story. The more I spoke to people, the more I realized I didn't want to tell stories about snowstorms and corruption and construction rules anymore. And let me let you in on a little secret. Corruption, death, and destruction sells. Happy stories don't sell. Now, I'm not dissing the news industry. I strongly believe that reporters, good trained journalists, and editors can change the world when they uncover a good, solid story. But I also believe that inspiring stories can change the world, too. So I came back from Israel thinking it's time for a massive change. I was scared to death, but in my gut, I knew it was the right decision. I was supposed to anchor for a week right after coming back from Israel. But the day before I was supposed to go on the air, I lost my voice. I wasn't sick. My voice just literally disappeared. An anchor cannot anchor without a voice. To me, it couldn't have been a clearer sign that it was time to quit. I got a lot of pushback from my friends and family. No one could believe that I would actually walk away from such an incredible gig. But my gut told me otherwise, and I left, I just left. And I concentrated on my health and wellness business and eventually an opportunity presented itself. I was serendipit serendipitously reunited with an old friend about three years ago, two years ago, that I hadn't seen in 25 years. He was the boyfriend of one of my best friends who was tragically killed in a car accident when we were 26. He was also the guy who was driving the car at the time of the accident. While we were catching up, now his life is beautiful now. He has a family, he's happy, he's living in the West Island. But I was, you know, I realized, wow, this is an incredible story to tell. This is inspiring to people. And we realized that we both had a massive story of inspiration to tell about how you can get through anything in life. You can't get past it, but you can get through it. And so we realized wow, this is maybe the shift that we both need. And we started co-writing this book together. It's my first book of what I believe is going to be many other books. And we, we are almost done and we plan on publishing it by the end of the summer. And finally, I decided that it was during this past four years since I left Global, obviously the past year, a lot of people have had a lot of time to think and ponder and have insight um, into the you know different things that they want to do because we were all, you know, we were, we're sitting with our own thoughts and we had time to think. I decided it was start to, time to start giving back in a bigger way than purely making donations. So in January, I became a founding member of an organization called 100 Women Who Care Montreal. The idea was to gather women three times a year for one hour. Each woman donates $100 to a charity that the collective members choose. Last week was our first event and we blasted through our $10,000 goal. We raised almost $15,000 in one hour for a shelter for battered women. So that is the kind of 
things that are now inspiring me. And a lot of it comes from what I learned from all these people that, you know, along the way you look at tragedies and you look at stories and you see how there's so much that can be done. Um, and now since this is a sisterhood, I'm gonna wrap it up with a little blurb about women. I started my career thinking women had already made it past the glass ceiling because in my reality, in the newsroom, they had. Now, of course, I was completely wrong. I also tried to stay, another thing I often did, I, I tried to stay away from certain women because I felt like women more often than men, certainly at the beginning of my career, would so often tear each other down to try to get to the top. That unfortunately was sometimes the case, but not always. And quickly I realized that strong women banding together could have a massive positive impact on all parts of our culture and workplaces. I truly believe that empowered women empower women. And that's one of my primary goals as I move forward through um, the different stages of my career is to really help rise women up because I believe together we can do so much good for the world. And that's kind of the twist and turns of my journey. Well, thank you, Paula. That was terrific. I actually didn't know that you started off at CNN in, in the States. I did not know yeah. that at all. <laughs> I, so there are a few questions for you. Um, I do remember the ice storm because my kids were just born. They mm -hmm. were creamy babies. Oh, I know, yeah. After three days, we lost power with three babies. So I do remember that a lot. Um, is there anything about reporting that you miss? Oh yeah. Oh, there's so much about reporting that I miss. I, I really miss, I, I really miss the privilege of going into people's homes and getting, you know, having them confide in me the, 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 the stories that have changed their lives or talk to me. And it, it's not something, you know, I've gotten to cover all different parts of Quebec. It's, it's not something that you, a lot of places I've been to, I wouldn't have been to if I wasn't a reporter, but Definitely being on the front line of stories, definitely being able to, to chat with people that I wouldn't normally chat with. And like I said, my favorite thing to do is talking to real people, not politicians or stars, real people. And that I definitely miss, but I think I can do it in a different way. What I don't miss, I love telling stories. I never loved being stuck telling the kinds of stories that the newsroom wanted me to tell. And so I'm trying to you know, I'm going to be starting a podcast soon as well. And through writing books, I'm, I'm finding other ways to tell those stories. I think your next book should be collecting stories of other people. Like this one is, your book is yeah. about the accident, but it would be great to have a collection of stories from, you know, so great many people. That's a great um, idea. What, how has the news changed over the years with social media? Oh, great question. Um, how has the news changed? A lot. Okay, so to begin with, everybody thinks they're a reporter. That's problem number one. <laughs> everybody with an iPhone and is filming. Now, it's really good in some cases because if it wasn't for the girl with the iPhone, we would never have witnessed the horrific um, George Floyd death, right? And that changed things dramatically with Black Lives Matter and all of us witnessing just that horrific event. However, if you don't have, the, the thing is about journalists is that you don't realize that there are so many levels of what we call vetting before the story gets to print or on the air and fact checking and double fact checking and triple fact checking. And one of the biggest challenges that journalists have is that everybody thinks they're a journalist because they have an iPhone and they can film stuff, but filming stuff doesn't give you the whole picture and talking to one person doesn't give you the whole picture. And so part of that was the 24 hour news cycle because when I was working in 24 hour news, we used to call it feed the beast. Like there's 24 hours to fill. So when there's no, there's, sometimes there's no stories. You gotta find the stories. That was challenge number one with the 24 hour news cycle. Challenge number two came when social media came along and challenge number three was when Facebook decided to do Facebook lives and then everybody thought they were on, on the scene reporter, but there's no fact checking. And yeah. so there's all this misinformation that flies everywhere because nobody has to fact check. And then when somebody has a lot of followers, people think that they have knowledge that they don't actually have. And it becomes a massive challenge for reporters to put out 
information that is fact checked and it, it creates, you know, what you're seeing with people not believing news. There's a lot of stuff that news has to fix, but a lot of it comes from they think the story that they see on Instagram or on Facebook is a real news story when it's often just copy pasted by somebody or someone's personal opinion, which isn't news. Yeah, and I guess it's, I mean, that's dangerous as we we know that because it spreads the wrong news, but it's very dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Also, and, it's very instant, like, right? So before you would go edit the story and nobody knew about it until it came on the news, that must be a challenge too. So, for, for so that's, a, that's a really good point. So one of the biggest challenges we had when social was Twitter, because when Twitter came out, we know, so it used to be there was a breaking story or somebody had an exclusive story and we knew somebody had an exclusive story and we wouldn't find out about it until the six o'clock news, right? But when Twitter came out, it basically made us as reporters have to constantly feed the Twitter feed to tell the story throughout the day. And so what happened to, I'll tell you what, this is in, in actually, in, what happened at this, while we had to do more and more work because we had to do the Twitter feed, we had to do 24 hour news, we had to do lives, we had to write all that stuff while we're getting our interviews together and get the news on the air. Um, at the same time, we had to, there were other people who were tweeting who didn't have to fact check. And so we had to fight against that. And so, and then on the other side is newsrooms because all of this was happening, their budgets were being cut. And so we were being cut smaller and smaller and we were given more and more work to do to get the same news out. But rather than just telling a story and then going into editing, we had to tweet, tweet the first part of the story, do a live about the first part of the story, tweet the second part of the story, do a live about the second part of the story. By the time you got into the newsroom, you were already exhausted and then you had to write a whole different story and then get into editing. And so that's a huge part of what's changed in social media is that you're constantly on. It's 24 hours, always. There's no such thing as no news because you're always having to report what you're seeing when you're out in the story. And I don't think 24 hour news is a good thing for mental health all the time, right? Oh yeah. It, I mean, it, it's, and like I said, a lot of times, a lot of times. Oh, it's not it's right. Not, yeah. A lot of times there's no news. You just have to feed it. And so part of it is that people, you know, I'm a big believer in news. I'm, I'm, I'm always mm -hmm. a news person. Us. But there's, you know, you don't need to, you don't need 24 hours of news. No. You don't need it. And no. so you're right with mental health. You, it's very easy to be panicked when you're watching the same news of, you know, whatever rallies or hate going on or death going on. And that's one of the reasons that I decided to leave is because there are so many stories that I know are out there that mm -hmm. aren't that, that can inspire people. Right. Um, what would be the most or one of the most inspirational stories that you remember? Somebody's on. Wow. One of the most inspirational stories that I remember. Oh my goodness. There's so many. Um, or a favorite that, and uh, I guess a continuation would be like, wh who was your favorite person to interview or something, you know, like inspirational and favorite. Well, okay. So inspirational, um, one of my most inspirational stories was, um, you know, it, it's always comes down to uh, kids and it always comes down to like, the, that was an inspirational story. So there was a story, there was a little boy who um, was, uh, there was a doctor here, I can't remember, what, it was probably the children's hospital. We did a lot of uh, really touching stories with children's hospital. And I became actually the person who was called to do those touching stories because I really was good at capturing the emotion of a story. And I actually was sent in all the big funerals because I could really capture the funerals, the feeling of the funerals. But one of the most inspirational stories was the story of this little boy and a local Montreal doctor who um, was born and was, he had no lifespan. Like they, his parents were told he wasn't going to live and he wasn't. And you know, you hear a lot of those stories, someone, you know, and they, they struggled and they did it and thing, but to actually interview the parents, this little boy was four years old. And the first shot that we got of him, he couldn't walk and he had learned to walk in his four years and he was running towards his doctor. And, um, 
when it was actually a family, it wasn't a Montreal family, it was a family that had been flown in, I think from Haiti and they were able to get into the Montreal Children's and so they camped out in Montreal and they sort of moved everybody to Montreal. And just the amount of work it took for those parents to uproot their lives, to find a way to live here, to find complete, total positive belief in, in what was possible for this little boy and to connect with doctors who had that same kind of belief, you can't help but walk away from those stories with a newfound belief in life. Like those, that story sticks out because that little boy was so incredible, but there's a lot of stories like that. There's a, there, and that's, that, that's what always inspired me is stories like that, that particular one. That, I, think that, I think that one won an award actually, that particular story. And then one of my favorite interviews, oh my goodness, God, you know, there has been, okay, so one, I'll tell you one of my least favorite interviews. Yeah, that, I, that was the follow-up question. Yeah, so I'll tell you one of my least favorite interviews because I was a producer at CBC News World in the middle of, um, it was politics, 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 politics in the 90s in Quebec. And I had to interview Robert Bourassa. Mm -hmm. And I was, like, I'm like, how am I gonna interview Robert? I, I don't even know what to say. Like this man was so huge in Quebec, right? And he obviously wasn't premier anymore, but he was so massive. And I didn't have, I had a list of questions and I didn't have the, I thought I had the facts straight, but he was sharp and so quick that he was like, he was answering me back. Like, that's not what happened. That's not what I, and I, I didn't, I wasn't seasoned enough to like, smooth it over and get it back. So that was, I walked away from there thinking, oh my God, okay, I have to, it's a, after days of you know hiding, I, I realized it was a massive lesson on how to prep for work because, because a politician like that, who's lived through everything, you've got to really be sharp and on your game. So that was definitely the least favorite interview I ever did. <laughs> Um, but my favorite interview, actually, you know what? My favorite interview I ever did was with Chris Hatfield when he had just gotten back from that massive trip on, you know, when he was singing in space and doing stuff. And he came, I was hosting the morning show and he came on with all the most incredible stories. And he was, you think he's gonna be, you know, this really snobby guy. And he was the most charming, the loveliest of people. And I still have a picture of him listening into my ear. I think you may have seen that picture because there was music going on. You know, you have a little ear piece when you're, when you're anchoring the news. So he leaned in to say, What's, what music are you listening to? Well, I'm sitting in front of you. And he was just, he was, he was amazing. And, um, it's always amazing when you meet people that you think are going to be a certain way. Right. And instead of being that certain way, they are, they blow you away with inspirational inspiration and insight and, and thoughtfulness. It was, I think that's probably one of my favorite interviews ever. Cause Chris Hatfield, speaking of him, my, uh, cousin, Stephen's cousin in uh, Ottawa, the son has a podcast, him and his friend, he's very, very smart. And they asked, he actually agreed to go on their podcast and he spoke and listened to it. And he said the same thing. He was like the nicest person. He was just super, super nice. These two, two young guys in Ottawa, you know, yeah. space, space nerds, nice. loved it. Yeah. And there's a different kind of perspective that happens. He told me when you see the earth from above, yeah. When you're looking down on the earth and you see how connected we all are, your perspective on everything changes. And, you know, that kind of insight, not a lot of people have. And it's an amazing thing to be talking to someone like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I think that's it. I don't think we have any more questions. Um, your charity, can you just tell everybody again the name of the charity? So if anyone- well, The charity is called 100 Women Who Care Montreal. Uh, and we, like I said, we had our inaugural event two weeks ago. Everybody can join. We like, we like Our goal was to get 100 people to join and we hit 150 people. And it's women, it's obviously it's 100 women who care. And basically what we do is, like I said, it's, it's simplifying donations because a lot of people are super busy. They don't think they have enough time to volunteer. They don't have to think they have enough time to really put in the effort that a lot of these charities do. And so we want to simplify it. We're, we're not alone in doing it. There's chapters throughout Canada, but we are, um, we are the first ones in Montreal to do it. And the concept is, is that it's a member run organization 
all members, we have a theme for every event and members um, nominate who they think should be, um, sh the money should go to. The last theme we figured because we were a woman run organization and because we were, um, it was right after the pandemic and women have really been hit at a different level during the pandemic. Um, we thought it would be a good idea to have a woman based organization, charities and so, amazing that the majority of charities that were nominated were shelters they were all shelters. a lot of them were shelters and so we picked the we, what you pick we picked three out of all the nominations and then the night of the event this time it was zoom but next time it's going to be live because it'll be in september october at the night of the event each charity comes and uh presents their charity and then the members vote and the winning uh charity gets our money and it, like I said, it was $15,000. And then the other thing that we're going to start doing that's an added bonus is because we know that the restaurant industry in Montreal has been hit so badly during the pandemic, um, we're going to start doing events at restaurants. So yeah. we're going to invite everybody to come to it. We're going to pick a restaurant and invite everyone to come and everyone has to at least buy a drink so that we can pour money into our local restaurants on top of that. That's an added level of, of a way of giving back. Well, I'll be there because I belong now. I'm one of those hundred yeah. women. <laughs> and it, yeah. I highly encourage people who want to get involved. It's a great organization. We have one more question. Um, sorry, this is from Judy. Which news outlets do you recommend and which to avoid both print and TV? I know in our house, there are some American stations that we won't watch and others we tolerate and others we'll watch. So... So, okay, so that, you know, that begs another question. So news, um, you know, it's objective, but mm -hmm. it leans in one way or another, right? So there is left news, there is right news, there is kind of middle news. Um, and you, like, I will tell you, I, I, I'm afraid to recommend news stations, but I will tell you that it depends on your perspective and what you're looking at, right? CBC, for example, in Canada is a crown corporation. And so they have to follow certain guidelines that CTV doesn't have to follow or Global doesn't have to follow. And they tend to be, because they are a crown corporation, they tend to be a little bit left-leaning, but it depends on the show and it depends on the journalist. Global is the most right-leaning of in Canada. And I'd say CTV is kind of in the middle. And look, it depends what kind of news you want. It, CNN gets a lot of heat but i will tell you that cnn is one of the um it's very even killed their reporting and it's I, it's not because you don't agree with what they're saying that the reporting is bad like reporting is an opinion you know when hmm. somebody's talking and it's a talking head that's opinion but reporting even, even fox that we know is so far right and the american thing if you're looking at their newscast their reporters are actually quite good they lean right, but it's their talking heads that give Fox the crazy, uh, some people might like it, but it, it's the talking heads that give Fox the right wing, um, you know, and the pro Trump or whatever it is, um, point of view. But if you look at the newscast, it's different. So you really have to differentiate between talking heads and news. They're not the same thing. And Definitely. one of the reasons that talking heads became so big and opinion rather than news <laughs> became so big and people confused the two is because a person sitting at a desk doing a show talking about an opinion is a lot cheaper than a whole bunch of reporters who have to go out there and do a newscast it's a lot cheaper and so when 24-hour news came into effect they realized well how are we going to fill 24 hours we'll fill it with talking heads right and so that's how it went but you have to be really careful talking head with an opinion and the yeah. show has a view is one thing, yeah. newscast, completely different thing. So back to that question, it's not that I would recommend one or another. I would just say, know what they're, you know, what, know what newspapers are coming from. Like here in Montreal, I'm, if we can just talk about the route, like, I mean, I live, you know, two blocks away from the Israeli consulate. The, the, the rallies were in my backyard. They were in my backyard. And I'm amazed, pleasantly amazed at how many French journalists who I thought would never have stood up against the anti-Semitism that was so obvious on the streets mm -hmm. really came out against it. 
And so, because they're journalists, because they see what's going on and because they have knowledge. And so, you know, it, it's, every paper is either left, middle or right. And so you got to sort of take, pick and choose from, from those. Okay. Uh, final question. Somebody asked about your hair. Like, where do you go to do your hair? <laughs> but I know that you blow dry it yourself. Uh, so, you know, today is a very, I mean, I honestly, I, <laughs> I, uh, I go for my hair color. I go to Evita, uh, Marcel, if anybody wants to go to him, but my, in terms of, I mean, I, I, my hair is extremely curly and extremely frizzy. So on days like today, I just pull it back and gel it. And then, <laughs> and then I take it down and it, it does this because of the gel. And then my hair curls in the back and it's, it, it really, so, um, but <laughs> my hair colorist and when I get it cut I go there too but I when I used to work at Global we used to go downtown because they were they were our um, go-to hairdresser so but yeah but thanks for asking <laughs> so on that note <laughs> we're gonna say thank you so much that was very a lot of fun very insightful and we look forward to your book I'm sure it should be one of many thank and um, everyone have a wonderful safe summer and we'll see you um next well it's like next jewish year is when when we start up again so after rosh hashanah i believe so um, let me just say one thing because yeah. i saw the question for my actual hairdresser her name is ilian because <laughs> 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 someone asked who's your hairdresser <laughs> <That's her name. laughs> okay. thank you offer i hope i hope i you know i i hope i brought some some value to this talk and i i hope you were inspired from some of the stories and thank you all for for okay. inviting me thank you thank you so much